Good morning again. So, really, reading for this week, you've got to got two weeks to read. You've got till uh, I get back. So, for hobby, we're going to talk next time about the seals. He was like, are we just going to talk about the one seal? And then when he found out we got to wait another week, he was like, yeah, why are you doing that to me? So, but let me tell you, I appreciate more than you will ever know the earnestness and the eagerness that you're showing. I, I can't express how it makes me feel. I, I really appreciate it. And it makes, it makes me rejoice to see you hunger after that. Um, so I promise next time that we're going to talk about these. And we're not just going to talk about maybe what they are. Because remember, the all of prophecy, and if, if my eschatology is right, we will be watching this from the balcony. All right, we got the mezzanine, you know, bird's eye view of it all. So it's really, in the grand scheme of things, not important. And if we're right about this, but what is important is if we can get an idea of what these are. Remember, everything about prophecy is building events. That these horses, these riders of the apocalypse, don't just appear on the stage out of nowhere in a vacuum. There's events that have to be laid so that these riders can be set free, are set, set free from the seals and sent forth to the earth. And those do happen before the rapture. You know, Famine, economic collapse, war doesn't just happen to this extent. Doesn't just happen all of a sudden when when the rapture happens. Boom. There's something. There's a journey. This is the end of the journey of this particular journey of the breaking of the seals. This is the finish line. But there's a path, and that's what we're going to talk more about is the path. But today, when we're going to kind of take a review of this. A lot of you were here for this. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about the rise of Islam and its role in Bible prophecy. I firmly believe that Islam is going to play a tremendous role in Bible prophecy. Um, but first, let's just figure out what is Islam. Well, founded in 622 by Muhammad, who was a trade merchant in Arabia. Islam, the name, means submission. That's very important. There's a lot of misinterpretations and, and misuses of what the name Islam means out there. Those are the politically correct terminology, but it's not the traditional terminology and not what Muhammad put forth. Remember, whether it's Christianity or Islam, you want to know, or the Constitution of the United States, you want to know what is meant by the words you're reading. Go back to the original source and see how the people who originally heard that treated that document and obeyed it. Kind of like the Second Amendment. If you go back and look at the Second Amendment in the Constitution and how the Founding Fathers meant for it, you know that it wasn't just meant to raise up an army. It was meant to, and it wasn't just meant so you could have a gun for hunting. Okay, it was meant for tyranny, to put down tyranny of an oppressive government. Okay, uh, If you want to know how to treat the commandments in the Bible, you want to know how to interpret what Jesus is saying in the New Testament, just go back and look at church history, early church history, closer to the source, and see how they treated that. If you want to know what Muhammad meant when he wrote the Quran about, you know, smite the infidel above their necks, and all of these things, don't listen to somebody that's 1,400 years removed giving you their interpretation of it. Go see how his immediate followers acted upon those words when he was still alive. Because if they had gotten it wrong, he would have certainly let them know. Okay? So I'll, that's the reason why context is so important. It's so important to have the context of the day that in which the text was delivered. Not your interpretation, your tradition, a thousand years, two thousand years later. What did it mean to the people of the time? So, in the day, Islam meant submission. Submit or die. 
Uh, they have uh, about 1.3 billion adherents. Now I think that number is actually up to about 1.6. They have sacred texts, the Quran, which all of you, you K-O-R-A-N, Q-U-R-A-N. There's different ways of spelling it. It's the Quran. Uh, and also the Hadiths. Now the Hadiths are um, basically commentaries on the Quran. They're, they're the passed out teachings. And they're not as sacred as the Quran, but they are considered sacred. All right, and, and a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to be today is going to be drawn from the hadiths. Uh, within 12 years, the entire Arabian Peninsula had been captured. Within 100, the Muslim world was stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to China. So, when you hear Islam preaches peace, Islam is a religion of peace, and I will remind you that that phrase started with George Bush, not Barack Obama. It was George Bush that said Islam is religion of peace. Within 100 years of Muhammad starting Islam, they had conquered most of the known world, except for the northern parts of Europe, had gotten into Spain, had gone all the way over China. It, and they, had done, they did so by the sword. So, do you believe the original adherents to the Quran and Muhammad's teaching believe that Islam was peace or war and violence? Look how they received that word and acted upon it. It's very simple. So, he was born in Mecca. He says in 610 he was visited by the angel Gabriel, and in fact he was probably visited by a demon. Uh, he gave him the surah, which is the uh, chapter in the Quran. And the Quran was given to him over a period of years. Uh, first it was orally transmitted, and then later uh, compiled by a guy named, uh, by the name of Abu Bakr which is interesting because we actually had a guy show up in my unit back in 1995 whose name was Saeed Abu Bakar. And at the time I had no idea, well, you know, his, his, his old name was Clarence Williams. And so just to tick him off, we'd call him Clarence. Um, nowadays that'd probably get us kicked out because his, his changed name was Saeed Abu Bakar. So he had, he had named himself, when he came to Islam, he had named himself after the guy who compiled the Quran. He began preaching to Meccans in 613, and he and his followers were persecuted for preaching, because they were preaching to pagans. Uh, the war with the Meccans began at, uh, in the 620, and then the, the truce of Hadid Yabaya in 628. Hadid Yabaya is extremely important. Now, it's not important that you realize the name Hadid Yabaya. What is important is you realize that this is a false peace. And that it is part of the Islam, it's called taqiyah. It is part of the Islam culture to lie to the infidel, to get what they want. And then at the time when you have laid down your arms, just like the Meccans, they will kill you. Uh, the Oslo Accords, Yasser Arafat, had to go back and explain to all the Palestinians, quote-unquote Palestinians, why he had done this. They were like, what are you doing making peace with these infidels? And he said, and it's on audio. It's not something that some Zionist, it's on audio. He said, brothers, treat this peace treaty the same as the peace treaty between our Prophet Muhammad, blessed be his name, and the Meccans, the treaty of Hadabayah. So in other words, in, in Yasser Arafat's mind, this was a peace treaty to buy time to destroy. Herman. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that that guy that's the real name? Or did he acquire that name? Muhammad? Yeah. That's, that's his real name. That right? his name or like that's his real name. Yeah. yeah, that's his real name. So, here are the... Uh, Islam operates under five pillars in which you have to obey to please God. Can you give me some more orange juice, please? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, the first pillar is that there's one God, Allah, and his Muhammad is his prophet. The second is to pray the Salat five times daily. Uh, our president said that one of the most beautiful sounds he ever heard has ever heard is the praying of the Salat. 
Let me tell you, to me it was the most haunting when I was over there and every morning I was awakened by them praying the Salat at 5 a.m. because there was a mosque right outside where we were initially staged before we went forward. And that tower was about a half a mile away and it woke me up every morning at 5 a.m. They pray that. They, they do that yeah. in Bulgaria. Allah wanted 300 gods, 300 gods. Well, that's later. <laughs> he was the only one that my, well, I think it's in here. It may be in here. Uh, so the third pillar is fast during the month of Ramadan. The fourth is to give alms to the poor. And the fifth is the Hajj. That's, yes, Herman. That's to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Who's the Lord? Yes. <laughs> Good things come to him who waits. Yeah. Good on. things come who hymns to, to him who waits. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there's two you've heard of, there's two there's two different branches of Islam that hate each other. Sunni and Shia. Now this has to do with who this all has to do with power. Who's going to be in charge? The Sunni believe believe that when Muhammad died, uh, they would it was basically to the best party. Who, who is best to lead us? It doesn't have to be blood related. Uh, Abu Bakr, they backed, they backed Abu Bakr, who was the guy who actually put the Quran together. The Shia thought power should be inherited. So what you have is you have a democracy kind of here. Let's elect the guy who's most able to lead us into the caliphate. Or you have a, uh, yeah, a royalty thing, uh, you know. So that's the difference. And there you go. There, Shia or the dark green, which is mostly around Iran, little pockets in Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Sunni. Sunni is by far uh, the largest contingent. And then you have this little pocket of Yemen with the Shia, which is why there's a big war going on down there right now between Iran, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia. So, to sum it up, who is the real Muhammad? He's a false prophet. Uh, he beheaded his enemies, and the Quraysh, the Jews of Mecca, he beheaded them because they would not submit. He was a pedophile, by our definition. Uh, you really want to tick a Muslim off? Tell them Muhammad's a pedophile. I've done it. Believe me, they don't like it. But oh well, I ain't afeard. Uh, he married. He married Aisha when she was six or seven, and he consummated that marriage when she was nine. And he was 53. Oh, that's nasty. Wow. Okay? So he was demon-possessed, and the Quran is a satanically inspired text. I have no doubts. Okay? And, and the Scripture backs us up on that. Whatever does not come from God comes from Satan. Right. Anything that we may think is just a production of man, demons. We have to realize that this is how they wage war. We as Christians like to go through, oh, well, that those Moonies and those Harry Krishnas, that's, a, that's a man's invention. That's a, no, it's demons. And demons have created every false religion, whether it's Mormonism, uh, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Druidism, worshiping a tree. All of it. To point away from the one true God. Yeah, people are very shocked when I tell them anything outside of Jesus Christ is a the doctrine of demons. It's a cult. It is. It's a doctrine of demons. And that's what the scripture says in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, Islamic teaching about Jesus. Uh, believe it or not, they're actually more conservative than some quote unquote Christians. They believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. The Quran teaches that. Uh, they believe he was a, a prophet and a godly man, but he's not the Son of God. He was not crucified for sin. He did not resurrect. He did not die, but actually ascended to, to heaven during his uh, crucifixion. They believe he was crucified, but not for sin, and that he never died on the cross. God took him before he could die. Yes, Herman? Uh, Brother Hanson, I've got a good friend. You know, he's heard so much about the Quran, and then he bought one on. Online. Mm -hmm. Seven bucks for that thing, I believe. Four dollars. Six or seven. He said, he didn't start reading. He don't believe in it. He just won't know what it was about. He said, the more he reads it, the worse it gets. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. So that brings us to this actually. Moderate Muslims. There is no such thing as a moderate Muslim. This is the biggest lie going on right now. Uh, a moderate Muslim is a heretic to their faith. You need to understand that. Uh, I view a moderate Muslim no different than a moderate Christian. Because a moderate Christian doesn't accept the truth of their scripture. They accept the parts that they want. And you've seen them. You've got them as Facebook friends. They accept the parts of the Bible that they're comfortable with. But the hard stuff, the stuff that gets to their personal proclivity, that doesn't apply anymore. We're going to ignore that. Okay? Uh, Jesus is a way, but not the way. All of those things. That's modern. Yes, you're... The Episcopal Church, how they have compromised the truth, and Methodists are starting to do it now. They are compromising the truth of Scripture, and they are no different than what a Muslim has done who is a moderate Muslim. They compromise the truth of their quote unquote Scripture. Uh, many moderate Quranic translations, they're not true translations. Um, because most, most of Muslims don't read Arabic. So they have their interpretations of their... It's kind of like a difference between the King James Bible and the Living Bible. <laughs> okay? There's a big difference. There really is. Okay, so eschatology. There's what eschatology is. the part of theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul of mankind. Now, we have the Bible as our source. That's what we're studying. The Bible. Okay? as a source of our eschatology. The Islamic eschatology, they study the Quran and the Hadiths, which is, like I said, a recording, a record of the sayings and the deeds of Muhammad and his teaching on the Quran. So a lot of the Hadiths are actually dictations from what Muhammad said that this verse means this. And then it's these scholars that have expounded upon it. But here's like the key. Commentary? Kind of, kind of like a commentary. Yeah. Uh, huh? Like kind of like yeah, kind of like the Babylonian Talmud. Yeah. Uh, no. So this is a bunch of people who I don't know who they are. Um, but the the key, yeah, the key point here here's what we need to know. Here's what is important. The the prophecies in Islam are mirror images of the prophecies in the Bible. They really are. I have studied prophecy for 30 years. I have studied Islamic prophecies for a couple of years. I have studied a lot of Hadiths. I've read more Hadiths and watched more YouTube videos of Imams talking about the Hadiths than you want to even want to know. Hours upon hours of watching these guys. Kind of like watching Billy Graham talk about the Bible. These guys are talking about the Quran and the Hadiths. And what I came to the conclusion of a while back is that black is white, white is black. Upside down is right side up. Good is evil, evil is good. If, there, if the scripture, if the prophecy in the Bible is, is that this guy is bad, then the prophecy in the Quran is this guy is good. In the Bible, if we've got a bad guy, the Antichrist, in the Hadith, the good guy is the Antichrist. And he, just hold on. Okay. So, the Mahdi, to Herman's question. See, slide 19. <clears throat> the awaited Savior, he's also known as the 12th Imam. They believe he comes from the family of Muhammad. Now, these are all prophecies in the Hadiths, mostly, and a little bit in the Quran. But this is what the Islamic world is looking for. This is what he will look like. He will stutter. He will unite and reform Muslims. Because right now there's a huge division in the Muslim world. Shias and Sunnis are killing each other everywhere. Sunnis are killing Shia in Syria. Okay, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they're Sunni. Iran, why do you think Iran's in Syria bombing the snot of ISIS? Because Iran is Shia. The Mahdi will somehow manage to bring these two together. God help us when that happens. Hopefully that happens after we're gone. He will be a fanatical Muslim. 
Now, as I read these, I want you to think back to Matthew 24 and Revelation, some of the stuff we've read, Luke 21. His coming will be announced by earthquakes, the oceans and sea storms, the oceans raging, and fire sights in the heavens. So in other words, when God says, look at, you see all these things, you know your redemption draweth nigh, to the Islams, when you see all these things, hey, Mahdi's coming. These are good things. He will rule the world. He will be an unparalleled spiritual and political leader. Now, these are not my words. These are the words of Islamic prophets or prophets and teachers and scholars. And these have been what they're looking for for a thousand years. This is not some new idea that, oh, well, the Christians think that that's the Antichrist. No, no, no. This is who they say they're looking for and have for a very extremely long time. So who does this sound like? He'll be an unparalleled spiritual and political leader. He will come in power via a peace agreement. And guess who the peace agreement's with? Jesus. The Jews. Gee, is that nine, Daniel 9 maybe? He will rule the world from Jerusalem. He's going to make a covenant of peace with the Jews. How long do you think that covenant of peace is? About three and a half years. No. Oh, so, yeah, but he... Now, again, this is not Christian eschatology trying to interpret the Hadiths. This is what they say. And they've been saying this long before modern Christian eschatology came on the scene to say there's going to be a seven-year peace treaty. When they were saying this, most of the Christian world were still all millennialists or post-millennialists. Remember, it wasn't until World War I that we became pre-millennialist rapture people. They've been saying this long before we got it on the... On it. Yes, sir. Brother Nelson has also just read about this book. He'll have a mole on a certain part of his face and a space between his two. Yes, he will. Yeah. I, I can't remember if that's in here or not. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, he will conquer Israel. <laughs> yeah. He will conquer Israel for Islam, and his headquarters will be in Jerusalem. He will cause Islam to be the only religion practiced on the earth. He will come in riding on a white horse. I think we just talked about that last week. A white horse, his rider had a bow and a crown. A Stephanus was given to him, and he came conquering and to conquer. He will be helped by the people of Iraq. He will make a truce of Hedegabiah, with Israel and then break it That's what I say, three and, and three and a half years yeah. into it. Yeah. Now, this is the interesting part. He's an archaeologist. They believe he's an archaeologist. He is going to produce previously unknown biblical texts that will prove that the claim of Christianity is false and that Islam is the correct faith. He's going to produce an Apostle Paul manuscript. You, get, you need to know that Satan has been working on this plan for a long time. And 2,000 years ago, Satan inspired somebody to write something. It's sitting in the desert somewhere waiting to be discovered by this guy. It's out there right now. With all wickedness, deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and be saved, therefore God sends them a strong delusion. People are going to believe this. Okay? He will recover the Ark of the Covenant from the Sea of Galilee and bring it to Jerusalem. From the Sea of Galilee? Yep. He's going to recover it. And why would he recover the Ark of the Covenant and bring it to Jerusalem? Okay. Think, think ahead of time. Think before that. Can you have a temple? You can't have a temple without the Ark. Hey, guys, build that temple. There you go. Put that Ark in there. And in three and a half years, I'm going to plop my bottom on it. Now, aren't they, I've seen on TV that they've already found books or scrolls that they say was documented. That is correct. And that's been happening more and more. Yeah. It sure has. Mm -hmm. He'll present himself as the Jewish Messiah. He will establish the temple as a seat of authority. This is all the Hadiths. This is not this is not our interpretation. I want to stress you know, that. That is crazy that the Hadiths would say the Jewish temple and And they have been saying that it gets better. For centuries. <laughs> 
This idea of a Jewish temple and all of this stuff, you have to understand that this is just relative within the last 50, 60 years of Christianity that we have put these together. The, the Hadiths have been saying the exact opposite for centuries. And they don't have to destroy the Dome of the Rock. Nope. That's exactly right, because it's in the wrong spot. That's chapter 11. We will, he will change the law and the times. We talked about this, the Sharia. Yeah. That's Daniel 7.25. He shall think to change the times and the law, and shall, they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. He, so he will move the world to Sharia law and the Islamic calendar. Now here's where it gets interesting. He will establish a new world order. This is uh, the Hadith. The, the Hadiths say the appearance of the Mahdi will be preceded by an army carrying black flags. Now, Mahdi will join the army carrying black flags and march on Israel. That is one of the Hadiths. So we're going to look at another one, depending on who gives the Hadith. Some people say that yes, he preceded by, meaning that they come before him, but not that they are leading the way for him. Okay, and I'll explain that in a second. He will wield miraculous power from Allah over the wind, rain, crops, and other miracles. Many other reasons uh, as to why the Antichrist may not be a leader of the revived Roman Empire, uh, not the European Union, will be covered. We're going we're, we're to talk about this when we get later. Uh, but I have a theory on this, and it's a brand new theory. I mean, within the last month, as we saw the refugee crisis unfold. You have two main theories, two main theories on the kingdom of the Antichrist. One is this, that the revived Roman Empire, and when we think of that, we think of Europe. And if you look at any old prophecy book, Hal Lindsey book, you're going to see revived Roman European Union. A newer theory is that it's, remember, This is Rome. The legs are Rome. Remember, you had a Western Empire and an Eastern Empire. We forget that. And the Eastern Empire was Arab. So the second theory espoused by some people like uh, Walid Shabbat is that the Eastern leg, and actually, uh, Sage Mont, uh, uh, I can't remember his name. Stuart. No, not Stuart. Uh, teacher. Uh, oh, Jim Hastings. Jim. Yeah. He, he espouses this as well that it will be the eastern leg. However, I'm coming up with a new theory that if we are any length of time away from the second coming, <clears throat> that it could actually be both. Because what's going to happen in Europe is they're eventually going to become Muslim. They're doing it now. As you say, they're in the process. Exactly right. So, now here's what's really getting interesting. He's going to have a... I've heard uh, a Syrian... This, this, hold on. You got, we got, we're going to get there. Wait, hold, hold those questions. Okay. He's going to have a helper, believe it or not. He's going to be the Mahdi's second in charge, and his name is... Nope, it's not the Pope. It's not the Pope. The false prophet is not the Pope. Nope. As we, we talked about this very briefly, that the beast comes out of the sea... And the sea always in the Bible represents the, the people, the nations, the Gentile nations, but that the false prophet comes from the land. The land in the Bible is always representative of the Jewish nation Israel. We know the false prophet has to come from Israel. It's not the Pope. The Pope is something else. We'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, Revelation 17 and 18. But the false prophet is not the Pope, unless for some reason the Pope is Jewish. Because otherwise, all our symbology is now thrown out the window. All right? He will be a religious leader. And he's going to claim that he's Jesus. Now, yes. Remember, Isa is the Muslim Jesus. And Jesus... In the form, the false prophet in the form of Jesus is going to come and say that he is the Mahdi's helper. I'm Jesus. All that stuff those Christians are saying about me is absolutely wrong. Don't listen to them. I'm Jesus. I know who I am, and I didn't ever say I was the Son of God. That's what he's going to say. 
And you'll be a subordinate of the Mahdi and seek to magnify him. He will preach that what Christianity has taught about me is wrong. I didn't die on the cross. He will abolish Christianity. He will abolish the Jizya. Now, what is the Jizya? The Jizya is a tax. If you live in a Muslim country, a devout Muslim country, this is the tax that keeps your head on your neck. You have to pay a tax to keep your house, to keep your life. He's going to abolish that. Because, see, the Jizya tolerates your Christianity through the paying of money. He will not. He's going to say, no, it's either submit or die. There is no pay a tax and stay alive. The bondsmen of Jesus and the other religions are outlawed. Does that sound like Revelation 13? Okay. <clears throat> Those who do not worship Allah and the Mahdi will be beheaded. Exactly like yep. He's said to return to the earth on the last days near a mosque in Damascus. That's why what's going on in Syria is extremely important. He will arrive at a time when the Mahdi and his army are preparing to pray. He will be offered, because he's Isa, he will be offered to lead the prayer, the call to prayer. But he will then decline that and refer to the Mahdi, glorifying him. And that is the point where the Mahdi will be seen as the Mahdi. When Isa says, no, he needs to lead not me. There's a point, kind of what happened with John and Jesus. Remember, there came a time when Jesus said, no, the one coming, I'm not even worth untying his sandals. He will then pray behind the Mahdi as a subordinate. He will establish Islamic Sharia law. Remember, these are Hadiths saying that Jesus is going to establish Sharia law. Change the times and the laws. There we go again. He will kill all the Muslim Antichrist and his followers. The, you, you realize that the Islam, the Muslims teach that Jesus is coming again. They teach that there's a man coming after seven years. Except for they call him the Dijal. It's not Jesus. He's the Dijal. And for seven years during this time, the Muslim Mahdi will be prepping the world for the second coming of Christ. Saying, when you see this guy, he's of Dijal. Jesus is coming with all of us at that point, whether it's pre-trib or post-trib. We're all going with him at that time. You need to know, this is what we're going to be fighting. Because for seven years, he will have brainwashed the population that he is God, and that whoever's coming now on this white horse out of heaven... That's the Antichrist. It's exact flipped on what will really happen. What's going to be the names of a mark? Revelation 13, you got to wait. Okay. Got to wait. And that's not in here. That's in Revelation 13. Uh, he will come after the Mahdi has been ruling for seven years. The Dijal, they say the Dijal will claim to be Jesus Christ and claim to be divine. Well, yeah, because he is Jesus Christ and he is divine. <clears throat> He will be Jewish and will be followed by Jews and women. All the ladies said, Amen. He, the Dijal, this is where they depart from reality. The Dijal is going to be slain by Isa. Uh, wrong. Flip that. Jesus is going to slay the fake Isa, the false prophet. He will go throughout the earth and try to convince Muslims that he is Jesus and that the Mahdi is false. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this. We'll get into it later. But that could be why there's these 1,290 days and 1,335 days spoken of. Uh, and I please read Daniel 12 and look at that. It could be that this whole process takes 45 days. That it's not an instantaneous thing. That we as Christ's subordinates go through town to town, village to village, city to city, and proclaim Jesus Christ. And meanwhile, all these knuckleheads are there ready to fight. Now, there are going to be those saints that have been huddled in 
in, you know, in confinement and secret, they're going to come out and go, hello, we're here we are, we lived. And we're going to embrace them, but there are going to be people fighting. Now, they ain't going to hurt us. Okay, that's just some speculation on my part. And we'll talk more about that at a later time. Uh, so, miscellaneous, ISIL. Uh, Peter Casey was beheaded in Dabiq, Syria. He was the first American that was actually killed by ISIS. Um, the Hadith ISIL is using says that the, the capture, they will capture Romans that they say are Americans. They, the, the ISIS believes that the, the Romans mentioned in this Hadith are actually Americans. Uh, and hold them hostage in Dabiq. The Romans will show up and fight there. Fight them there. So you need to understand that when Peter Casey was beheaded in Dabiq, Syria, the reason why he was beheaded in Dabiq, Syria, was because they were trying to lure us into a battle in Dabiq, Syria to fulfill their hadiths and their prophecies. It wasn't just some random place that they chose. Oh, that's just killing here. No. They chose Dabiq because they were hoping to lure the Americans into a fight there. Because, see, they, uh, they pointed out they were Dabiq in their video. Uh, then they've also pointed out in that video that the coming of the Mahdi was near because they were fulfilling prophecy to antagonize America. You need to know that the turmoil in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, uh, Iran is doing this. Iran is starting a fight with Saudi Arabia and the UAE and, and, and all these countries because they feel that there first has to be a war between Sunni and Shia before the Mahdi can come. They feel that that's, that has to happen. They've got to defeat the Sunnis before they can defeat us. So that's their, you need to understand there's a method to all this madness. It is madness, don't get me wrong. Yeah, they feel like that has to happen. It has to. Yeah, anarchy and chaos yes. is what ushers in the mind. Right. So, so from my research, uh, from what I found from some of these, quote unquote, not moderate Islam, but some of these... Uh, Sunnis that had a little bit, some of these imams that I listened to on YouTube. They believe that the Mahdi comes at a time of great upheaval in the world, and he's responsible actually for bringing peace. <coughs> See, a lot of people believe in the Islamic world that they're going to create violence, and that's how the Mahdi comes is because he's enjo he enjoys the violence. No, what some uh, Hadiths teach is that Mahdi comes in response to quell the violence. So what they're trying to do is make it as absolutely violent as possible to lure him out of hiding. It's kind of like baiting a fish is what they're trying to do. So ISIS and Iran both believe that causing a people will provoke his arrival. As such, they feel they have nothing to lose. And everything to gain. Now, it's possible that the Mahdi, this is, a, this is where we diverge in the scenarios, will actually fight ISIS, ISIL, the Islamic State. That some of the Hadiths that I've read, the interpretations, was that these ISIS guys, these, these, moderate, these Muslims, they know that they're bad. And that what will happen is that the Mahdi will come and fight them first and then bring peace that preceded by an army of black flags, he comes after them, basically, to stop them, to bring a false peace. So that after defeating the Islamic State, he then turns his attention to the Palestinian issue. He will make a peace treaty with Israel. Part of the deal will be to divide Jerusalem, which God says do not do. It will include allowing the Jews to rebuild the temple. And then he will break the treaty and persecute Israel, and the Great Tribulation will begin. So that is the general summary of Islam in the end times. We, we need to remember that everything that is happening, as crazy and as maddening as it seems, is part of the journey. It's part of our journey towards this end time goal. And that it all has to happen as crazy as it is. Uh, do I know for a fact that the Antichrist is a Muslim? No, I don't. And in fact, he's probably not a true Muslim to the sense 
because he's a, a no true Muslim would ever claim to be Allah, which is what the Mahdi will do. Remember, the Mahdi, uh, the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians, he will magnify himself above how many gods? All gods. If you're God and you got a name, he's going to put himself above you. It doesn't matter whether your name is Jehovah, Allah, you know, uh, one of a million Buddha, Hindu gods, it doesn't matter. He's going to magnify himself above all of them. Because, in the grand scheme of things, all false religion has its origin in hell. In that sense, all false gods are equal. And there's only one real god of false religion, and that's the devil. So, any questions? Any questions real quick? we got a few minutes. Your, the, the third thing there was the possibility that it's a, essentially a unified, revived Roman emperor, empire. Would it be possible then that if uh, you're, you're talking about him not being a true Muslim, that it would be the idea that the uh, Muslims take over all of Europe and the leader is actually not Muslim, but somebody that came in and helped could be. unify that is actually yeah. somebody still from Europe? It could be, except for in the Hadiths, if we look at the Hadiths as a. Because in a sense, the Hadiths, even though. When you look at the Hadith, you have to remember one key important point. They're written by Satan. Right. Satan is a deceiver. Right. And so, I have a book about that thick of Hadith. I mean, of printed out Islamic prophecies. No joke. Okay? And when you read that, knowing, basically, if it says it's up, that means it's down. If you can read that, then you understand that it probably is Islam. Because of the way their Isa, Isa will come. He will break all crosses. Yeah. Okay. He will kill all the swine. So if you like a good pulled pork sandwich, don't look for it in the tribulation. Sorry, Georgians and South Carolinas. Um, and he will no more bacon. No more bacon for you. Oh, that's a big tragedy. And 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 then he will abolish the jizya. The tax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and because of that, I would say that I think he's going to be a reformer. What, what if that's part of the bringing of peace? It could be. Is that somebody that, that comes in and says, Father, it could be. Abide by this it could be. It could be. It's yeah, it's an interesting thought. You know, you know who the main candidate right now for the Antichrist is according to Islam? I mean, not your crazy ISIS people, but your average Muslim. There's, there's two candidates that they're looking for. That they, that they, you know, we as, as, I'm not, we as, a, as a Christians in America, we've always had these candidates. Tony Blair could be the Antichrist. Yes. Some people thought it was Ronald Reagan. Some people thought it was Mikhail Gorbachev. Okay? Yeah. You know, all of these things. But if you're in the Islamic world right now today, you've got two candidates. You know who they are? King Abdullah of Jordan. Yeah, Jordan. And the president of Turkey. Because recently, about two two months ago, the president of Turkey was giving a speech against ISIS on peace, and a dove came out of hand of heaven and land, a white dove and landed on his shoulder. And that is one of the signs, according to the Deis, of the Mahdi. It was all over the news in Turkey. What is that guy's name? Uh, President of... Uh, the, 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 mm, can't remember. I know, that bothers me. So, keep that in mind. Both of those guys are kind of reformers. I mean, King Abdullah. Yeah. I think that's who we're kind of looking at. We're not looking at uh, Sheikh al-Baghdadi. Yeah. As I think we're looking at somebody as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. And so, yes... And for three and a half years, he's going to be like that. that. Yeah. He's going to be that way. For three and a half years. But that's him from Jordan, but it says Jordan will be squared from Jordan and Lebanon. Jordan and, and uh, yeah, Lebanon. Which could be why they're spared. Yeah. Makes sense. Because that's his country. So, lots to think about. But here's the, here's the final thing. No fear. Perfect love casts out fear. 
Nothing to worry about. You live in interesting times. You need to know that millions and millions and millions of saints have picked up the copy of the Word of God and wondered, what does this mean? And you are actually sitting here watching it unfold before your eyes. And that's incredible. That's incredible. Don't be afraid. What, Don't be feared. What do you think about next year for the scripture? I don't know. But I think we're seeing it set up. So, all right, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, once again, we're amazed at your word and the truths that are there. Father, help us to realize falseness when we see it. Give us discerning spirits, Father. Speak to us, Lord. Father, we give you praise. Again, Lord, we ask for protection as we all go our separate ways this week and, and for time that we can uh, spend together with family, but above all, can be ambassador for your love. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.